Good evening and welcome to Kunsan Payal Choli. As always, we're really thrilled to have you join us today and for a teaching by Chatsama Akamamo. Today's teaching was given in 2007 and it's another, um, it's a teaching that describes many ways that Dharma can appear in the world in addition to those we might immediately associate with Dharma. So hope you enjoy it and here we go. say that it's kind of interesting that in um, the request for teaching being the final prayer before, uh, often before one receives teaching, um, I am moved to talk a little bit about how hard it is to practice Dharma these days and how differently Dharma is uh, starting to appear as it moves through our culture. And of course, as it moves through our culture, the first, maybe second, and third wave of those students who are karmically connected and who come up to practice Dharma, each of them will, and that's, that's both a lovely and scary thought, add their own little piece to the stew, you know. As, <laughs> as, as Dharma moves across a new country, it always absorbs some of the culture of that country it always absorbs some of the flavor of that country and it always kind of makes room for some of the dif difficulties of that culture. For instance, when the Dharma went to Tibet, and previously most Dharma practitioners were vegetarians for the simple reason that they wished to do no harm to other beings. But then when uh, the, uh, I was a vegetarian, no, when Dharma moved to Tibet, uh, that was almost impossible because of the extensive long winter uh, and how odd it is that even though there are glaciers and streams, there's also a lot of wasteland and desert on the plateau. And um, there are fertile valleys in which it's easy to grow things, but, and, and, and in that case, they're, they're like, even their wildflowers and their wild greens and shrubbery are like medicinal herbs, nothing like you know, the, the, the stuff that grows around here, you can't even feed to your cow unless, you know, <laughs> unless cars are way, way far away from it. It's not like that in Tibet. But the growing of anything other than just fundamental grasses, the, the, the vegetables, is very difficult. And so when Buddhism went to Tibet, it changed in its character somewhat. It had to mix and mingle uh, with the shamanistic uh, tendencies in, and the what's called the bone religion in uh, Tibet. And rather than, there was some competition, some infighting, but rather than that, there was more of a blending and a compilation that took place. And that is due to the incredible compassion, insightfulness, enlightenment, and pervasive wisdom that Guru Rinpoche had, uh, has, and, and um, he was able to see what to accept and what to reject. And of course, we who are practicing Dharma, and you know, since we seem to still be living ordinary lives and so forth, um, in many ways, we, we can't say that we've like graduated to the fourth bumi or the tenth bumi or any of that stuff. If we do say that, we're probably heading for the, for the kooky house. <laughs> so, um, 
But on, on the other hand, uh, we, we, we feel some semblance of courage, and yet still we're, we're not safe. We're not really uh, so married into the Dharma that we really understand it. And, and a lot of times we're practicing Dharma, but we don't really understand the essential nature of Dharma. And so our fledgling American Dharma is indeed a fledgling. None other, none other than His Holiness uh, Pena Rinpoche has done so far amazing things to ensure that Dharma will be firm in America. For him to come every year the way he has and given the retreats that he has, in essence giving Shedra teachings to students who, I mean, across the board, I'm sure, in all the humility, we can admit we don't even deserve these teachings. <laughs> We hear these teachings and we go, yowzer. And it, it's pretty amazing. And so for some then there ensues the confusion, and it is a big confusion, of um, you know how to live, how to be, how to act. And, and some of us think, make the mistake at least at first of thinking, Oh, I'm in the deep water now, so I must be a lifeguard. <laughs> 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 Whereas I'm thinking, you're in the deep water now. Good to learn to swim. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, in the beginning we think, well, I mean, you know, I'm wearing some robes and I've got a cup, at least four malas and, you know, and I get to take these great teachings and with, with things in them that you're not supposed to tell other people. <laughs> that makes you ever so cool. And then we, you know, we get into that and for a little while we're kind of doing the ego hokey pokey, you know. We're all puffed up. And then after a while we realize that, you know, our, our life is about the same and our job is about the same and our health is about the same. And, you know, in many ways we are making great strides because our understanding, or at least we as people, are becoming deeper. The water is deeper. It's a deeper water. Uh, little by little, we learn not to simply judge by appearances. And that's a big, 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 big coup. You may not think that's such a big deal. But the moment your uh, judgment and sort of um, neurotic self-absorption and seeing everything from that angle begins to ease up a little bit, you're making a little bit of progress. That's really when you know you're making a little bit of progress. If, if you're still waiting for the magical um, Buddhism, aha, uh, I hope you've received enough teachings to know by now that Buddhism is something that is practiced every day with total mindfulness the practices bring result, but it takes a lifetime to get a, a tangible result. And, and for many practitioners, they uh, may remain fairly unaware of whatever progress they've made until the moment of their death. And then it's like hard to run back and tell everybody how smart you are. <laughs> Say no, don't forget to... <laughs> you know. so, So uh, hopefully we have all finally settled into living a sacred life, which means that you practice, you do the best you can, you know, you care for others, you try to follow the precepts, uh, you try to relieve yourself of the bur burden of narcissism, uh, because it's a terrible burden, it's just terrible hard to carry around, weighs a million pounds, and it's just your ego. Um, and we begin to slowly de develop the capacity to think of having a good heart. Even that simple term, you know, which His Holiness the Dalai Lama has, uh, you know, written about and talked about a great deal, that that is, that is a shining first step on the path to Dharma. Having a good heart means, you know, you let the good judgment go. You try to be helpful rather than hurtful. Uh, you, you attack 
and, you, and there is an attack. You attack your five poisons. You are required as a Dharma practitioner to go after them. I mean, it, it, it should be something of a valiant effort. You should be able to step up like a warrior. And many of us are here in America, we have that capitalistic, dependent, kind of uh, think, uh, um, economically dependent, materialistic kind of thinking. And uh, so we, we have that. And in, in America, we do have a little bit of a warrior edge. You know, we're taught, go get them. You know, that's supposed to mean something. And so we have that, that kind of habit in us, that flavor in us. But now, of, in Dharma, we're, we're being asked to apply that to these precepts. So that if we find that we have slothful behavior, well, that sloth becomes the enemy. And the most skillful way to practice that is to not make yourself the enemy. That's the guilt. That's a different religion. <laughs> so guilt is not useful. We, you know, we, we practice what we have to practice in order to get our, our stuff together. So <clears throat> if we find out that pride and arrogance is our habit, uh, then that becomes the enemy uh, from the point of view of Dharma. Um, the pride and arrogance, why are they the enemy? Because they, they will bring unhappiness. They will bring enmity with others. They will bring that kind of fighting spirit into one's life. Uh, and plus, nobody's going to like you. <laughs> There's always that. And pride is a deadly sin. It's uh, one of those, I hate the word sin, but pride is a deadly non-virtue. Let's use that. Uh, deadly in the fact that it's very difficult to humble oneself enough to open the heart and really see the splendor of the three precious jewels as they appear in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha relatively appearing as our own root guru in the world. We don't, you know, our pride and arrogance lets us think in theoretical terms. Oh yes, we take, we take you know, refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha up there somewhere. You know, but when we have to look at our own root guru or, or our own Sangha, which is one of the three objects of refuge, we say, Oh, not that teacher and not that sangha. <laughs> and so we think, you know, we think we're much further along than we actually are. Um, it's, it's true that uh, people can be irritating. It's true that we can, ha even our best friends can be irritating. Um, it's true that people can really blow it and make huge mistakes. You know, it's, tr it, it's true, but... The, these people that are our Sangha members are or are simply ordinary sentient beings that we have taken vows to care for. These are not the enemy. And if they've become the enemy, you left the path a long time ago. You see? It's our own pride and self-absorption and arrogance that becomes the enemy. And there are no exceptions. You can't say, you are being prideful and arrogant about that person, and I'm going to tell you how to really do it. <laughs> I'm glad you're giggling. Because, you know, we do that sometimes. We think, you know, we, we, you know we're, we're ready to go off about on how prideful and arrogant other people are, but we don't want to see it in ourselves. You know, we just don't want to see that. So it's difficult but very necessary to understand that the enemies we are fighting are the five poisons. They are hatred, greed, and ignorance, slothfulness, and pridefulness, and I think there's a bunch of more minor ones too. But you know what they are. It's, it's not hard to ferry them out if you put yourself in a Dharma environment 
and start to mix your mind with Dharma thoughts by reading Dharma books, you begin to see the contrast. Um, an excellent way to begin to see, to see the contrast is to read some of His Holiness the Dalai Lama's books because he talks to every man and every woman. You don't have to be a special or uh, um, advanced practitioner to understand his books and yet I promise you you will learn just as much if you are an advanced practitioner. So and th this is the magic of a Buddha like that speaking to us is that they speak in the language that we understand and that's just a tremendous blessing that we all share from His Holiness the Dalai Lama. <coughs> so right now we are trying to mix the context of our culture with Buddhism and also the context of modernity, our modern times. We really aren't, you know, five centuries ago. We really aren't, uh, you know, uh, uh, 200, 200 uh, centuries ago. We really even aren't from last century anymore. We're happening today, and today, there's the internet. <laughs> and there's TV and there's radio and there's all kinds of communication that goes on that lets us know what the world's all about pretty instantly. And here's that uh, the internet and the TV and the radio and everything feeding us information that I think is terribly biased. I mean, who am I? But I think it's terribly biased. Like for instance, when you listen to the TV and they tell you who the enemy is, I don't agree. I think the true enemy is war. I don't agree that it's that's good that you can label a country a democracy, and yet basically everyone with an education and some intelligence and a way, way to get away has left. <laughs> There's nobody left in Baghdad. That There are no doctors, you know? There are no uh, uh, highly educated people. How is that country supposed to go forward? But, we, but it's a democracy, so we won. What? See, I, I don't understand that. I must be really stupid because uh, it doesn't sound right to me. And um, then I'm, I'm taught to believe that all these deaths make sense and the reasons change, like weekly, but there's always a good reason and there's always some mouth to back it up. So I have trouble believing all of this bias. And so to me it seems that we have to learn to think for ourselves. We have to learn to realize that there should, there's no, that war is absolutely the enemy. And war is something that starts in each and every one of us. For each and every one of us to be so arrogant as, as to think that, you know, someone needs killing, uh, there's a problem there. Nobody requires killing. Um, for us to think that uh, we should dominate the world according to our expe expertise or our ideas or our uh, whatever, I, I mean, look around. Our, you know, our own country, the infra infrastructure of our country is falling apart. I mean, we could just go on. Does anyone read the paper? Does that, you want to read the Times once in a while? Oh. Oh, it's unbelievable. Just read what's going on. So, I read it and it makes me realize that in one way it seems to be like this snowball's going downhill real fast. And, uh, you know, I look around and I see bad signs. How does Iraq recover? How does the Middle East become balanced again? How in the world? I don't see the causes for it. How will that happen? How will we, as a nation, bingo, everybody, every, all of all the middle class jobs have been shift overseas, and, uh, and and you know people that are that have been that have been working in manufacturing sections for 40, 50, you know, sometimes years of their lives. 
uh, well, 40 years of their lives suddenly find themselves out of work with no retirement. I don't see where that's going to happen. That, that's going to get any better either. Uh, now the uh, the hidden seams, you know, you're beginning to see the job. The house market fall apart and blah, blah, blah. Well, you don't need me to tell you all this. Um, this is all in the paper. Uh, it's all uh, pre-published. I don't get this from the celestial spheres. All of this information <laughs> is available to you as well if you give a flip. And I do. I really do. So, and then I look to other places in the world where enmity is only getting worse. I mean, I look about, I look to Africa and look at what's happening in, the, in several of the countries in Africa, particularly, of course, the most well-known one the, in Darfur, where there's such, ex, it's just extermination. Extermination. And what is going to happen to those young people that grow up without their parents? that grow up having been beaten, robbed, raped, had parts of them cut off, you know, been treated. How are they supposed to grow up and be decent people? Who's going to care for them? So when I step back and I really look at it, I get a real dark picture. And it makes me very sad. And it makes me realize that um, this is a time to step up in Dharma. I really, I want to gently put forth an idea. Um, I think that because the world is getting a lot darker, we have to be, we have to, the ones of us that are committed to Dharma, that are committed to living a sacred life, I, I really believe we have to get a little more creative. You know, we have to think out of the box a little more. We like to stay in this nice, tried and true conformist path. You know, we think, oh, you know, we're such rebels. We're, we're, you know, we're not the regular religion in America. We're Buddhist religion in America. But then within Buddhism, we're totally conformist. We stay right within the guidelines. To my way of thinking, ever since Buddhism became Mahayana Buddhism and then grew into Vajrayana Buddhism, there was an inherent teaching in that to show that Buddhism grows as the times grow. Now, there was a time when a monk couldn't touch a woman even if she was dying at his feet. But that's no longer the case. If a monk sees a woman that is in need of help, he can pick her up, you know, support her, get her to a doctor, give her some chicken soup, whatever she needs, you know, to help her. And that is covered by the Mahayana view, which is the Bodhisattva's vow. So, and then nowadays there is Vajrayana, in which it is nearly impossible to live, in li to live a life in which you do not harm others. Vajrayana comes in a time in which we ourselves are helping to pay for a war. I, mean, I have tried to find ways out of paying for this war, offering my, my tax money to other areas. Instead, I'm willing to pay the taxes. I just don't want to pay it for war. Can't do that. So I'm accumulating this non-virtue, and so are you. Because we're, because 60% of what our government collects, as far as I understand, goes to war. So it's impossible not to, to, to hold that uh, simply do not harm attitude and think that that will suffice. We go down the street in our car, you know, 100 gazillion miles an hour, which I know you do. You say you don't, which I know you do. i um, seen you drive. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, now it's cicada time. It's, cicada's the newest item on my dog's menu. One of my dogs <laughs> brings them in. <laughs> Poor thing's screaming. <laughs> So it's very hard to, to just, you know, try to carry the straight and narrow and have that be suffice, have, have that suffice for you. You may convince yourself, but I think we have to go a little further. Since the times are advancing, we have to advance. And we have to get, we have to get creative. For some of us, that might look like taking on 
a greater practice responsibility. Like say, all right, you want to make a real commitment to the world. So let's say you're going to sign up for a prayer slot twice a week in which you dedicate everything that you do to the end of war, to the end of suffering. And you really like, yes, you do your practice and you're into your practice, but the dedication is a very important part of the practice. It's deep and it's profound and it's heartfelt. And that is a contribution. Because is, why is it a contribution? Do your prayers go out and make magic in the celestial spheres? No. You change. That's the contribution. And when you dedicate merit, also that merit is there and there is some benefit. It's like, kind of like money in the World Bank. No, man, that's a bad <laughs> Okay, and money in a theoretical World Bank that actually works for everybody. How about that? So, and then, of course, when you work collectively, and this is why we're so grateful for one another, no matter how much we gossip about each other, <laughs> or how much we judge each other, we're so grateful for one another because we could not maintain this merit-producing machine of the 24-hour-a-day vigil for the sake of sentient beings if we didn't have all of us. I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful effort, and it's something that every Lama who's ever been here, including and especially, and most particularly, my own precious Lama, His Holiness, has said that this happens nowhere else. This is just a new thing. This is a thing we started. And this prayer vigil is an American way of, it's sort of like, <laughs> like a droop chin, except we're not very droop, which is powerful. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not really a long gen, so you call it sort of a, <laughs> it's like a, a very strung out droop chen, a drippy droop chen. <laughs> but it has the same idea of being a constant effort and a great effort. It is a great effort to have a 24-hour day prayer vigil. Any of you that participate in it should be very proud. I mean, that is an accomplishment to participate in such a thing and to have that opportunity to stop thinking of yourself and to benefit sentient beings. There's even a chair in there for you to do it on. I mean, you can just have at it. And uh, it's, it's something that, where else can you have that? It's, it's just beautiful. The likelihood that we ourselves will dedicate one hour or two hours a week on a regular schedule without a prayer vigil to praying for the prayer you may praying for the world you may do it for a while but you'll slack off so this is an ongoing structural thing that we have developed as a new taste it's American but it's Dharma there's no doubt we're doing Dharma practice and we're serving Dharma principles so In that regard, I've also looked at myself and I've said, well, here you are, turning into an old battle axe. <laughs> Teeth getting longer by the day. And uh, so what have you accomplished? So I looked around, I thought, well, you know, a few good things. Not, not so, I mean, some, some have done better and some have done worse. <laughs> and I, I don't like to get prideful about it, but Built a few stupas, got a sangha together. Um, you know, there's some benefit. But I'm thinking, what am I really good at? Well, I, I can teach to Americans. I can teach to Americans in a way that speaks to them and is a bridge and is inspiring. And all along, whenever teachers come and hear my teachings, which they have asked for on occasion, copies of it and so forth, because um, they want to know how it is that I do it, you know, how it is I teach Americans. They say, that absolutely, these are Dharma teachings. There's no doubt about it. But it's American style. And so I'm thinking, well, what, what could be my great contribution here? And I'm thinking, you know, His Holiness never wanted me to take ordination as a nun. He sort of kind of pushed me away from that. 
Well, that wasn't the habit of your predecessor. Well, maybe, you know, maybe not. And so, you know, I just kind of let it ride. Um, there, there's no really re no reason why I shouldn't become a nun uh, until recently. And then I figured out what was going on. His Holiness told me that he always thought I would do something special, um, very prominent and uniquely American that would solidify Dharma. And I wouldn't lie to you about this because I'm telling you from the throne. And they go, whoosh, when you do that. <laughs> 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 so I thought what what's that there's a trap door under there, there is and you know it, it's waiting for me <laughs> so I th so uh, what can I do and um, I realized I could do a little music uh, I've always, I've always thought, I've always thought, uh, it was actually a big event for me when I first got introduced to Buddhism. And I like world music. I like everything, music. I like lo lots of different kinds of music. So I, I, I like world music, and I thought, well, I'd like to get some recordings of Tibetan music, so find out what that lo that's like. Well, there's two types. There's the religious music, which sounds like, bang, 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 <laughs> <laughs> and it went very nice, but I don't think it's going to hit the top ten chart. <laughs> and these are all these, you know, giant horns and things and playing notes that we have never heard. <laughs> You cannot write the music down because there is no note for it. <laughs> so it's real interesting. But then there's also <clears throat> Tibetan cultural music. And so I, I got, got a hold of some of that. And the <laughs> Tibetan women sing like, it's way up there and it sounds pretty funny. <laughs> I can't do it. But they love it. And I thought, well, that's not going to work in America. So I thought, you know, every religion has music that moves us. It's like, remember when you were coming up as a kid um, when the Christmas music started playing? Now it means bye, 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 and it's axe murder music. Mm -hmm. But when you were a kid, Silent Night and all those things, you, you know, something really special was happening because the music was you know, um, uplifting and beautiful. And there are, uh, then there's American gospel music, you know, for, for Christians, uh, uh, that uh, um, uh, heart moving, you know, uh, spirit lifting, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, meant to be powerful in an uplifting and joyful way. Meant not only as an offering to God, but also as a way to be happy. And then there's, um, you know, like uh, monastic Christian music, which is really, uh, in its earliest stages, the beginning of classical music as we know it came from the church, or, you know, from writing about the divine. And so there's that big Western connection with church and music, and really uh, uh, Western music is uh, at, at its root connected to the church, Western classical. And of course, you know, um, as uh, black people that uh, worked in um, horrible slavery conditions and so forth began to try, they began to take on some of Western Christian religion because they were a musical people and because music was their only source of joy. They came up with music that went to gospel and went to blues and then became Motown, and then hip hop, and all kinds of stuff happened. But here we are, Tibetan, and we're like, nothing. <laughs> we want to sing, we want to dance, but we got nothing. 
<laughs> so, as you know, I began to make some music, and I wanted to talk to you about this a little bit, not to advertise the music so much, but more to share with you how I feel about this. The music to me is a giant net. Um, if anyone hears mantra, particularly like Seven Line Prayer or Vajra Guru Mantra or Om Mani Padme Hum, there are different blessings that come with each mantra. Like Om Mani Padme Hum um, can clear the way for a, a, um, a fortunate and auspicious rebirth. Om Ami Dewa Sri can help us to die consciously and with dignity and achieve a great rebirth. Uh, Vajra Guru Mantra uh, promises thus that we will meet enlightenment within seven lifetimes. Uh, uh, the seven line prayer, rather, and Vajra Guru Mantra. So my thought is, what are we doing si sitting on this? Oops, didn't mean that. What are we doing lock locking this up and keeping it, you know, in our own private little dee 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 with our own little malas when the rest of the world would be blessed by hearing it. So um, since I have never been a, a, a scholarly person and I was recognized way too late to break a lot of bad habits, uh, I figure it must be for a reason. And so I began to make this music that I'm hoping will hook people uh, into uh, at least receptivity about the idea of Dharma, if not connecting them with Dharma itself. I think of it as a huge net. It's like, you know, hope I can catch, catch all those species and give them some nice Dharma medicine. And um, uh, when I presented this thought to His Holiness, um, of course, there, I'm not the first person to make Dharma music, but a lot of what you see is more Taiwanese style, a very new age, you know, with uh, its um, a sort of lullaby style, you know? So, and some of it's very pretty. And some of it's very calming and nice, you know, ambiance music. But it's not really like American music that kids would like. You know, that hip people would like. It's not, you know, if you're really into music, you're not going to like that too much. So, I thought, well, maybe, maybe we'll get crazy here. When I was a kid, I grew up on the, in Brooklyn, um, and uh, I had this great, wonderful fortune that um, we, on the stoops of Brooklyn, there would always be groups of kids, young people, and I lived in a mixed neighborhood, and there would be these kids, these bebop kids, you know, they'd sit there on the stoop and they'd like step out a beat, harmonies with voices like unbelievable. And I would be like, <laughs> just drooling. And I could go to, I went to this park and there was this uh, group there of five guys, and they were, no, four guys that were called, that's right, they were called the Four Aces. And uh, they were practicing in the park there, doing their harmonies. And I was like, I want to be you. <laughs> <laughs> I never wanted to be a toku, actually. <laughs> that, um, well, I, I must have, or I wouldn't be here. Uh, I wanted to be a Motown backup singer. <laughs> So I thought, maybe there's a reason for all of this insanity. And so I went to His Holiness and I said, what if I, you know, I'd like to start making this modern music that, you know, kids are going to dance to it, they're going to sing it, um, they're going to mess the words up, but they might get something from it. And he said, go for it. He was really excited about it. Um, he thinks that this is necessary. Um, Karma Kuchin Rinpoche, when, who has, by the way, made, his, made some of his own mantra set to music, uh, was thrilled about it and uh, said that this, this will take care of China. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. It just, just, <laughs> he really, he, he's really hoping I can get it into China because it's, uh, you know, Americans doing this would be just a great, a great thing. And he thinks it would sell like crazy in China. So... Uh, you know, I've gotten a, lo a, a lot of good feedback from this. What, what I never wanted to be was a, like a rock and roll star. In fact, I don't even like to leave my house very much. As many of you know, I'm a very private person. I um, like to be in caves. <laughs> <laughs> taking care, feeding birds and taking care of animals. Um, 
singing doo wop. <laughs> That's my ideal life. But um, but I I don't know how that's supposed to happen. But with me being who I am and just putting out this music, I mean, it's not like I'm going to go touring. You know, it's a it's a it's a crazy thing, and I I hope it'll work. But the motivation is not to start another career or to add to this present career. I feel that it's part of my vocation. As this rebirth, this reincarnate Akamamo in the West, I feel that this is part of my vocation. And from what His Holiness said, it is. It is something that I should do for American Buddhism. Uh, to, help, to help Buddhism come into its culture properly. Uh, to let people know that lightning will not strike them if they hear a mantra. <laughs> you know, and to, to have it be, move into the category of more okayness. So, I'll show you this picture. This is His Holiness when he received an iPod full of our um, Payul American music. He's got his own iPod. Ta-da! Check out, where is he here? Doesn't he look very groovy right there? He's got that it, it thing going on, doesn't he? Is it possible to get the music up on the iTunes? Yeah, we're working on it. You want to help? Yeah. Yeah. Let's get his num number. <laughs> there you go. Check that out. His Holiness with his iPod. <laughs> and he liked it, too. They all liked it. one of the first smiles I saw from him. So, in case any of you haven't seen it yet, here it is. <laughs> it is in the bookstore. You want it. <laughs> Your friends want it. Yeah, 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 yeah. I wish I knew how to play the tablet. Yeah, oh, I wish you did too. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, here it is. There's a lot of mantra on it, and, and uh, if you don't ha all have one, you better get one. <laughs> And get them for your friends, too. Don't forget Christmas is coming. I think. It's a while off, though. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure someone's having a birthday. The newspaper won't, be a, won't let it be a while off very much longer. Mm -hmm. That's true. And then Daylog, uh, which is our next album, which is, this is produced in uh, Totally Killing It Studios in New York. Daylog is produced in that trailer. It's very hard to work in that trailer. <laughs> so I'm going to quote our dear friend, Yeshe Carbo, the engineer, who says at least three times a day, we need a real studio. <laughs> but anyway, we've done pretty well. Daylog has come, come out very well. It's a very exciting piece, uh, very unique, very different. Um, it's got a lot of different stuff on it than that. Some, some the same, but a lot of different stuff. And um, you should definitely have both of them. And so should your friends. Now, the reason why I'm asking you uh, this is not so I can sell records to people in this room. What I would like you to do is help. Uh, we don't have a distribution system. We don't have a record deal. <laughs> we don't have, we would, we would like to get some help. Um, I don't want you to think of it as uh, trying to get our band going or something juvenile like that. We're trying to get Dharma music out. Think of it as a spiritual effort, okay? Try not to think of it as just something, I mean, it's not ordinary. It's not ordinary music and it, and it in the sense that it's good music, but it, it has prayers and mantras and 
things that are, it's liberating. So anyone that hears this uh, once, twice, or three times is much better off in, in terms of their capacity to be connected to Dharma, perhaps someday enter onto the path very strongly, and certainly to have a, an auspicious rebirth. And these are all things that we want. I mean, uh, in, in Tibet, many times events are organized just so that thousands of people who will probably never practice, you know, or not practice very much besides, a, you know, once or twice a year, can come and receive some sort of blessing. This is the same idea. We don't have that kind of thing here. We don't have like general Dharma things where lots of lay people can come and get some kind of general blessing. So this is um, this kind of music could be an an example of a, of thinking out of the box. They still get to hear some mantra. They get to hear it from somebody who's considered to be a reincarnate lama. They get to hear liberating prayers. I mean, the prayer to Amitabha is extremely liberating. It's extremely beneficial. <clears throat> so, I hope you guys will get excited um, about this music. Um, I have actually come to understand that there's just uh, not many people are really understanding what's going on. And, and uh, a lot of times when you're working musically, you're pretty insular because you're kind of caught up in the creative buzz of it. And you just assume information's getting out, and it's not. And I would love your help in getting it out. Uh, this um, new album, Daylog, uh, I, I really, uh, that, that's going to be the, the proof of the pudding, because um, actually I produced it. <laughs> yes, I did. And, uh, and we have Yeshe. Uh, uh, Carbo is the technician. He's the mixer. He's kind of a, he co-produces a little bit. We have Tara's, Tara's got the most, first of all, she has the voice of an angel. And she has an ear, like, I've lost a few of those ear hairs, you know, you get as you're getting older, having too many rock concerts, you know, or something like that. <laughs> so it's actually kind of funny. When we're listening to something for flaws, I like to have Tara next to me because when she goes, oh, I can hear, I can feel her before I can hear it myself. <laughs> so it's kind of a thing, but I can hear all the, all the low end stuff pretty well. I've got a good ear too. Um, nothing wrong with them. So, but the Daylog is, um, is produced by us. Uh, we are actually forming our own production company, which is Blinded by View. And uh, we have become quite good, if I do say so myself. And uh, then we have uh, John Keenan, who is our mixer man in, uh, in uh, the Southwest, and he's helping us with mixing. And he has uh, some wonderful, exciting ideas that we use as well. So we have a nice little team coming up. Um, what I would like to do also is to help produce others who would like to make Dharma music. In other words, see, I'm really not trying to be the star here. And I'm not trying, I'm, I would like to make the way open for Dharma to become more Americanized while when maintaining content. And I'm thinking if we produce stuff here and you can make, you know, anybody wants to cut a record, let us know. Because we can do it. We have capacity to cut excellent music. Um, and, and I'll help you produce it. Pro Tools? Yay! So if y'all want that, I can... Gimme! <laughs> oh, my new mantra, Om Gimme Hum. <laughs> wow, that sounds very helpful. That sounds beautiful. So yeah, I'm, I, we've taken a recording of your Kyoto, right? And I'm hoping to produce that at some point. It would be a lot easier if we had a real studio to work with, but then I already said that, didn't I? <laughs> Anybody want to get on board for fundraising with that? Please let me know. I would like to also, from that studio, begin to do podcasts. 
where we can have podcast teachings, podcast performances, like readings with music, interspersed with me, with so, so much that we can do. If I could just get you guys to get behind me, you know? I know that we all are in our little, you know, we have our world and we have our path, and it's very hard to get the big picture. But really, when llamas come to the world and reincarnate, they don't have like the small picture of their own little deal. You understand? They have the big picture in mind. Hardly anybody comes back to one small life for, for just one little deal. Most llamas will want to come back where they can make a large contribution. And so this is the kind of contribution I am able to make. Um, looks like I'm pretty skilled at it. Uh, looks like the people I'm working with are pretty skilled at it. And as we open the doors, I think there will be other people. And you want to record a reading with uh, some guitar playing behind it? You could, we'll record it for you. And we'll help you with uh, balancing it and all. And this is, you know, the more, the more space we have, once, once we do get the studio, we can really open up to that and uh, make Dharma accessible to the public. It shouldn't be such an ivory tower thing. The day is coming where just, you know, I always liked the wedding cake idea, a broad base layer that everybody gets, gets a bite, you know, and, and a smaller layer where you have a good solid, you know, heart practitioners. And then that top layer, you get the retreatants, the ones that are really going into the high retreats and, you know, some of them are going to stay there. And that, that top layer on the cake is small. And I am so happy for you guys that have that opportunity. But won't you turn your mind, please, and think for those who don't. You see? They don't have that opportunity. They don't have a teacher. They don't have that connection. But what if they hear a piece of music and they go, oh, that rocks. I really like that. And they start humming, oh, mani pen me on. Well, we've got something. It's just a little bit of the big layer cake at the bottom, but it's something. Some nourishment for sentient beings who have maybe nothing. And so while the world gets darker and darker, we have to get more creative. Not more insulated, but more creative. How can we step out of the box to benefit others? How can we make compassion a hip subject? Because, you know, I, I personally like, I like, I love hip hop. But it's hard to take some of the reality of hip hop is born of suffering in the streets. And that's what they talk about. They talk about growing up hard, you know, and, 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 and hurtfully. And, uh, and there's a, it's truth, because that's what happened to them. And that's how they live, you know. But on the other hand, uh, why not use the same format, you know, take it out of that realm and produce something that would be not just a statement of how dark it is, but also a leg up to the way out. Huh? That's exactly right. It's exactly right. And to make music in our studio, studio, that's what you have to have. It's good view, good, good intention. And I'm inviting anyone to, to think about that. Think about becoming part of it. Um, if your music's good, we'll support it. You know, we'll put it online. What else can I tell you? But I think we should do this, and I think it shouldn't be like a private little secret that we have up there. I think you guys should all be aware of it. And I was also thinking, I'm trying to think how you could do it in that, that trailer because it's really so tiny. I was thinking, I would like to invite you all to watch us make something, just to see how it works. You'd probably have to come in in groups of five and hold your breath. <laughs> I, can, I can hear Yeshe and Tar rolling their eyes from wherever they are. <laughs> Mm. Now they're laughing. <laughs> but I, don't, don't you see the potential here? I mean, it's, it's hard to listen to what people are crying about now without wishing to add an antidote. And I wish to add that antidote. 
And so that's my motivation. My motivation is Dharma. It always will be. It always is. It's not, I'm not looking for a second job. I'm not looking for a raise. I'm not looking for anything other than to just cast a big net out into the world and give somebody a way in who may not have a way in or a way to connect with compassion who may not have a way to connect with it. So that's it. Thank you all so much for joining us today and um, for this <laughs> for this whole pitch on music but also you know just how it fits into Dharma in America and how wonderful it could be if we can connect a lot of people that way so um, I know this is still in Jetsama's mind and so many things have been gotten between here and there but who knows you know if you have ideas bring them on um, meanwhile um, we will shower you with Buddhist teachings by Jetsama Akanamo, in addition to Wednesdays at 7.30, at Sundays at 11 a.m. And uh, since they are pre-recorded, um, you know, you can also see them online. And uh, they are on YouTube. Uh, I'd want to say forever and ever, but, you know, for, for quite a while. So keep them coming. In addition, we have meditations on Sunday morning, Saturday, Sundays at 10 a.m., and uh, that precedes Jesuit's teaching on Sunday, and on Saturday is sort of a standalone there. Uh, in also, we have on Facebook uh, a can very condensed Buddhist uh, medicine Buddha practice um, that Jetsama did for uh, inspired by the situations with COVID, where it seemed like everybody, and it still does, seems like everybody really needs place where they can put their prayers and where they can know that they're heard and they're being um, offered by many people um, because things can seem so bleak when those around you are sick or, or dying. So with that in mind, um, she created a very short medicine Buddha practice and it uh, only runs about 15 minutes. It's every evening at 7 p.m. on Facebook and our uh, website on Facebook, which is um, Kunzong Bayo Jolene, Buddhist Temple. Um, uh, and it's, it, it brings a group together that, that you can put the prayers in chat. You can also put them on our website. Anyway, they, they all get moved into the place where many people are praying. So anyway, enjoy the, the opportunity to do that daily. We have also soak offerings, which is a food offering ceremony daily at the temple. Those are on Zoom. They're uh, offered up at Monday through Friday at 5.30 p.m., Saturday at noon, and Sunday at 2, barring um, bigger practices that might bump them a little bit an hour here or there. Um, so with all of that, you can find all of these on our website, uh, which is tara, T-A-R-A dot org. On that website, you can go to uh, Meditate, Pray, Study, and under that, you'll find webcasts and schedules. And on that calendar, you can click on any event, and you will find um, that it will tell you how to get to wherever it is and uh, what practice, if it's a practice we're doing, what practice that is. So um, please know that you're welcome to join us. We are happy to have you, and um, we hope to be able to support your practice. If you have any questions at all ever, you can reach us at kpc at tara.org. And um, you can ask questions and uh, it should get passed to somebody who can answer them, we hope. Um, so uh, please feel free to do that. Uh, if you want to make an offering to Jetsama, uh, having received a teaching, you can do so at jetsamagift at gmail.com is her PayPal account. That's where she lives on PayPal. 
jetsamagift at gmail.com, and it's in the chat. So with all of that, babble, 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 um, we hope you come back soon. We hope you enjoy um, these teachings, and we hope you enjoy more. So please come. Please partake of the Dharma. It's, and if you're in the area, please come to the temple. Um, the inside prayer room is not open quite yet, but we're hoping. Um, we're always hoping soon, soon, soon. Um, the numbers will go down, and we can do that and be safe and keep you around for a long time. But the outside is absolutely gorgeous. It's stunning. It's beautiful. The, um, it has statues of the Buddhas that have been empowered. It has um, wonderful stupas, um, which are basically the mind of the Buddha. They provide you a wonderful place to pray and, you know, make your requests and, and you know, pour your heart out. And it's uh, a great support. So um, with all of those and with the animals that Jetsuma has um, surrounded herself with in the back, um, you are welcome to uh, come and make friends with those guys. There's chickens and geese and uh, pigs and um, um, turkeys and guinea fowl. And I probably have forgotten something, but it isn't because I don't love it. So there you go. Uh, come, and, come and enjoy. And we hope to see you soon. We hope to see you online. And we hope, we hope the best for all of you and that all your wishes get fulfilled. Have a great week. We'll talk to you. We'll see you online soon.